Good evening, welcome. We are so grateful that you're here this evening and we're overjoyed with the tremendous response that we have gotten for our webinar, Sex Exceptionalism in Culture and Law. Uh, before we begin, please note that we are closed captioned. You can go down to the bottom of your screen and press the closed caption button to access those captions. And also please note that there's a Q&A that you can um, immediately uh, enter some questions for us. We'll have a, a question and answer session later. Um, and I'll be directing your questions to our panelists. Please keep in mind, we may not have time to answer all of the questions, but we'll certainly make an effort. And if your question is not answered, you can reach out to us at hello at restorativeactionalliance.org. Um, this webinar has been organized by Restorative Action Alliance, restorativeactionalliance.org. My name is Melinda Bronson, and I am the education team chairperson for the organization. I was drawn to this organization as a survivor of domestic violence and as a justice impacted individual and family member. Restorative Action Alliance is um, a regional advocacy organization working in Connecticut, New Jersey, and um, New York. And we are also in coalition on a national level. We are made up of crime survivors and individuals who have been impacted by the criminal legal system, and also professionals, academics, and restorative justice, restorative justice advocates and practitioners. Restorative Action Alliance exists to end cycles of sexual harm and state violence while honoring the, uh, the civil liberties and humanity of all people. I invite you uh, anytime after the webinar to go to our website, explore, see what's there. Um, we do have a monthly general meeting. We'd love for you to be there. Uh, a, a monthly education team meeting we also have peer support circles twice a month and um, mindful meditative art circles. Our uh, executive director, Amber Valangas and president Jason um, uh, host a podcast called Amplified Voices. You can access that via our website or Apple podcasts or other platforms that um, host podcasts. It's really worth your while to listen. There are amazing stories of justice impacted individuals. And um, as we know, stories are important for transformation. I did, um, I did want to also mention that Amber and Jason are often moving around across the country, speaking at conferences, at universities, or um, giving testimony up in Hartford. And I wanted to mention some really great news that is in alignment with our uh, webinar tonight. Something just came out in the Connecticut Law Tribune. Um, written by the um, editorial board there, mentioning um, uh, the fact that pending before the General Assembly is a bill, raised House Bill number 5242, an act concerning the collateral consequences of criminal records on housing opportunities that the Housing Committee introduced to prohibit housing providers from considering a prospective tenant's felony conviction in connection with a rental application after certain time periods. Amber did testify in support of this um, legislation um, with amendments. So I wanted to quote something. Um, in testifying in favor of the bill, Amber Valangas, a co-founder of the regional advocacy group Restorative Action Alliance, with a link to our website, called for amendments to prevent writing exclusions based on specific offenses or registration requirements into state law. 
by limiting those exclusions to those applicable as a matter of federal law. The editorial board writes, we agree with the Restorative Action Alliance that excluding people from the ability to access individualized assessments based on the category of their offense is out of line with the evidence and counterproductive to public safety goals. The evidence is clear. Recidivism rates for sex offenders are low. In, and quoting again, in testimony last year on legislation involving those on the registry, an expert on registries and recidivism testified for the majority of those um, on this registry, re I'm paraphrasing because this is blocked, um, I'm sorry about that, redemption is three to five years. After 10 years, virtually all of those found with sexual offenses present no greater risk in the community of committing any crime than anyone else. I think this is a, a really um, wonderful um, outcome and uh, congratulate Amber uh, on her testimony and the response from the editorial board at the Connecticut Law Tribune. I'd like to um, move forward now and just tell you how the hour will proceed. Um, uh, each panelist will have five minutes to talk about their work, um, their research, their writing, um, and how they connect to this issue that we're speaking of tonight, sex exceptionalism. Um, after each panelist has five minutes, I'll come back around with some moderated questions, questions that our AA has put together for the panelists, and then we'll come back again with questions from the attendees. So let me do some brief introductions, and then I'll pass it over to our panelists. Tonight with us, we're very um, grateful again to all of our panelists. Tonight we have Professor Aya Gruber. Aya Gruber is an expert on criminal law and procedure, violence against women and critical theory. Before joining the USC Gould School of Law faculty, uh, Professor Gruber taught at the University of Colorado Law School. I'll allow Professor Gruber to expand on that. So grateful you're here, um, Aya Gruber. And we also have C. Dreams, writer, public theologian, historian, and activist. C. is a writer and advocate, advocate interested in prison and criminal justice reform, LGBTQ rights, harm reduction, and government and cultural criticism. Um, she is currently working to diminish the, pres uh, the prison industrial complex. Her writing has appeared in Filter Magazine, Shadowproof, The Appeal, and Yes Magazine. Welcome, C. We also have Abasi Amin. Abasi Amin is the founder of the Association of Self-Respecters, ASR, an initiative that supports individuals in reentry. He is also an activist working towards the abolition of conviction registries and a world without sexual harm. Welcome, Abasi. And Emily Horowitz. Professor Emily Horowitz teaches courses in sociology and criminal justice at St. Francis College in New York and founded and co-directs the Justice Initiative there. Her scholarly research addresses the causes and consequences of mass incarceration with a focus on the harms of conviction registries and banishment laws. Welcome, Emily. And I should also say Emily is on the um, advisory board of Restorative Action Alliance. So I'm going to um, turn it over to each of you. Please uh, take approximately five minutes, uh, introduce yourselves further, and offer your interest, connection, or research on our webinar subject. So I shall turn it over to Aya Gruber. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for being here. I know that um, this is evening time and, and dinner time and to be able to speak to you tonight is a great privilege. 
I also want to thank Melinda and Amber and Jason for um, in inviting this panel to come together and speak about an incredibly important issue. And that is um, the way that American law and society treats people who are identified as having caused sexual harm or even not even having caused sexual harm, um, but have acted in ways that are counter to sort of the normative expectations of sexuality in society. And, um, you know, for me, and I'll, and I'll give you a little bit of background on, on myself and my work, but for me, you know, the more research I do on this topic, the more I really start to see people who are identified as quote unquote sex offenders. And we know that that term, you know, according to the research is in and of itself a powerfully stigmatizing term. Um, you know, they've done studies where you give people a vignette, right? And then in the vignette, you say a person who has caused sexual harm uh, versus a sex offender. And that language change in and of itself causes the research participants to become way more punitive, right, on, on the scales. And actually, the most profound effect is with the term juvenile sex offender, right? So even just saying juvenile sex offender means the person that you're talking about is like excluded from all the sympathies that um, society retains for children. And so the way I, the more, you know, the way I see it, the more research I do, the more I understand, quote unquote, sex offenders, to be almost like the canaries in the coal mine of what society and the government can be prepared to do to all of us, right? When you fit into a category that um, people so hastily jump to conclusions about and demonize, um, that opens up just a whole line of thinking and way of being and a uh, set of practices that I think pretend to really um, negate everyone's freedom uh, and and not just those in that class. So so that's kind of that's kind of why I think this discussion is so important. Okay, so my coming to the topic of sex exceptionalism. Well, um, you know, for a long time, I've been thinking about what I call in some of my writings going way back as a feminist defense attorney dilemma. And so on the one hand, you know, from way before I was a lawyer, um, I was really, really concerned with government detention power. I have a parent who was in the internment camps during World War II based on her race, you know, the Japanese were put into concentration camps. And so I sort of grew up thinking about, you know, how there are no real government safety-based detention success stories. They're invariably racist. They're in a legacy of enslavement. And, you know, th this is a very fraught thing. So from way back when, wanted to be a public defender. At the same time, right, as a woman and a woman of color, a group as a feminist, in the 80s. So that was a whole other moment of feminism. Um, and, you know, at that time, and I think continuing today, there was what I understand now, after I studied it for many, many years, is just a particular brand of feminism. But it was the one that was most salient to me, I think most salient in the pop culture continues to be. And that is a feminism that sees women's oppression as coextensive with individual men's violence, right? So it's not sort of economic oppression, homelessness, or all the myriad of ways uh, in which there's gender inequality, but the crux of women's oppression in society are individual men who commit domestic violence and rape, right? And so the key, therefore, in this, in this view, which I think is the popular feminist view, uh, the key to women's liberation, therefore, is using the criminal law to stamp out this violence, and thus we can achieve gender justice one incarcerated man at a time, right? And so this was the vision of feminism that I think, you know, and in a Me Too era continues to be uh, the dominant 
sort of idea of what it means to be for women's rights. It's to be very tough on crime for these sp particular crimes. And so this, you know, before I started to practice, threw me into a dilemma where, you know, I really wanted to be a public defender representing people against this, this carceral state, this racist, destructive carceral state that is an outlier in the world and an embarrassment for the United States. But on the other hand, I dreaded the prospect of ever defending like a rapist, right? Ever defending anybody charged with a sexual crime. And so strong did I feel this dilemma that before going into practicing as a public defender in Washington, D.C., I worried more about representing a man charged with a misdemeanor DV or a misdemeanor sexual contact than representing somebody charged with murder. Um, and, you know, I, I think I talked to a lot of my students who feel the same way. And then I went on to practice and I practiced in these systems that feminism built specialized domestic violence courts um, in under special evidence rules in sex crimes cases. And these were the feminist panacea. These were the ways we we as as feminist and, and liberal minded justice seekers were going to make the criminal penal apparatus. We were going to recruit it to the ends of liberty. Right. And practicing in these systems, what I saw day after day was what you could expect, a revolving door of collateral consequences, imprisonment, impoverishment and despair, mostly for people, poor people of color. And that includes many, many women and many women who were themselves victims who called the police for violence interrupting, interruption. And what they did was trigger an unstoppable penal machine that ended them up in prison and did their spouses, friends, family members, you know, ended up with people being deported um, and, and all kinds of consequences. So this led me to sort of study like the history of why it was that, you know, feminism got sort of um, almost overlapping to the point of being complicit with this mass incarceration penal system, how that happened, why nonetheless this this tends to be a dominant vision of feminism. Um, and that's, you know, sort of led to the feminist war on crime. And then just quickly on sex exceptionalism, you know, in writing the feminist war on crime, and it's been out a few years now, I do see many areas where women in this, in you know, women's rights group turned again and again to criminal law, which fit into various narratives like women being ideal victims, women being vulnerable, the masculine estate protecting women. And, you know, what I noticed in that story is there was an independent factor sort of pushing always towards criminal law. And that was this factor called that I call sex exceptionalism and, and other other people have called it sex exceptionalism. And that is this idea that whenever sex is part of the equation, so versus like, say, a homicide or a theft or a burglary, um, basically people stop thinking in critical raids, right, from, from they go from reason to rage and they um you know, have these knee jerk punitive reactions and this sense that if sex is in the picture, it's got to be the gravest, most horrifying, most damaging, most life destroying, biggest deal. And, and what's important about this is it's such a big deal that it, it necessarily has to lead to state sponsored solutions. So you cannot work it out at the lowest level. And those state sponsored solutions have to be punitive or else the state is complicit in the ind individual violence. And this, you know, this kicks in in a lot of criminal law speak, but the level to which people just accept this narrative and accept this set, this this way of thinking is so pronounced with sex crimes. I thought, well, I, I you know, I got to look at this too. So then I went back in history, kind of like I did with feminism, looking at sex crimes and, I, and I'll stop, I'll stop here, but it is profound how much government and society proclaiming the boundaries of lawful sex, who may have it, who's a sexual pariah, who isn't, 
has been coextensive with government repression. This sex has been an amazing way the government and powerful people in society have controlled reproduction. Who can live together? Who can be together? Who are the people who um, society can enslave, can put in prison, right? Um, when there are moments of political protests, right? At, we, we see this in the 30s. We th see this at the turn of the century when you have a lot of people on the street um, exercising political power. Guess what? They're not just called uh, you know, social pariahs. They're called sexual deviants. And they're arrested for lewdness laws, you know, um, disorderly laws that are at the intersection of sex and the street. So the more I studied sex exceptionalism, and if, and if you're interested, there's a Stanford Law Review article called Sex Exceptionalism in Criminal Law that I published like a few months ago. The more I see sex exceptionalism, not only as a site of you know, just bad criminal law policy, like criminogenic, not solving the problem, causing a lot of uh, problems in people's life. But symbolically, this under theorized sight of all of our oppression. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. All right, Aya, thank you so much. Wow, let me move on to see dreams, see. Please share with us how you came to this issue and amplify your um, your your history, your bio. Hello and good evening, everybody. Thank you, Melinda, for moderating. Thank you to all the panelists. I'm a big fan of several of y'all here, and thank you, of course, to Amber and Jason and uh, Restore. Uh, sort of alliance just justice alliance for putting this all together i'm very honored to be here and thank you for everybody who is tuning in and taking their time this evening to be here with us so i am c dreams that is a pseudonym that i use i started using that name when i was an incarcerated writer um so i am a theologian and historian i'm also a journalist and an activist and um, sometimes organizer and community educator i spend a lot of time working with nonprofits, pretty much trying to get them to rethink their approach to kind of uh, intersectional justice initiatives, trying to get them to see a lot of intersectionality between the movements, such as the prison industrial you know, complex and economic issues or class issues or environmental issues and how they all mesh and how they all have common roots. Um, I got into this particular issue with sex and sexualism, which I'm very honored to be here again, because I myself am a person who live on the registry. Um, when I was 19 years old, I was convicted of pimping and pandering of a minor. Um, my victim was somebody who was 17 years old and was a friend of mine. We grew up in the streets as young trans girls who were paying for hormones. We came from ostracized backgrounds um, and didn't have any sense of stability. And so you can imagine my shock and surprise when I found myself facing very significant, serious charges in a Southern state that has a predisposition that is set against people like myself because I'm Latina and I'm black and I was also a transsexual woman. So, um, they told me that what I was doing to survive was deviant and that I was a bad person and I was a monster. And um, the media tried to spin out this really huge, terrible and factually inaccurate story about everything that occurred. So when I went to prison, I saw a lot of stuff that was happening in prison and that's what got me into becoming a journalist. Um, as a theologian, a lot of my work has been really trying to get people to understand the relationship between a lot of the values that we have as a society and a lot of the ways that we think around sex, around masculinity, around femininity, around concepts of weakness or superiority and how they are attached to archaic and sometimes unhealthy concepts that are found in the Bible or Quran or other um, religious text. And so I spent a lot of my time trying to get people to question what it is they believe and why they believe that way and trying to get them to be interrogatory with how they view the world. 
Um, I think it's very important for you to not only be able to parrot what it is you believe, but to be able to soundly explain the reasoning for it. And I find that a lot of people have what I termed adoptive or hereditary beliefs. They're, they're kind of valuations around what is immoral or what is a panic, uh, a panic situation, um, such as I was talking about the kind of um, valuizations that we make as a society and relativity towards certain types of offenses, that word, I hate that word, but that is a, a colloquial word that we use, um, um, the types of conduct or types of behavior. These, a lot of the concepts that we have attached to that, believe it or not, even for those of us that we may not consider ourselves religious, but because we've grown up in Western society, which is deeply steeped in religiousism, we have adopted those. Um, so I spend a lot of my time doing that and covering the policing state, covering prisons, and just trying to get people to realize that the deep the issues are much deeper than this than what's on the surface. They're they're more fundamental and they're more philosophical. And that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, C. Um, Abbasi Amin, will you please share with us a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do? Okay, uh, but why I should have went first. Why do I have to go after those people that are so uh, articulate? You know what I mean? Now they have to downgrade to listen to me. You know, can you guys hear me? Yes, and um, you are here to okay. share. Yeah. Okay, because um, I just got a signal saying um, your your bandwidth is low. So if something happened, blame T-Mobile. But anyway, I just want to go. Th when I think about this sex exceptionalism, this came. It's um, uh, something came into my mind that something happened while I was actually in the prison. Oh, first of all, I should say, yeah, I'm a justice impacted person. That's how you say it, right? I'm subject to the registry and the so-called criminal legal, I like how Amber said, the criminal legal system, you don't say justice. All right, so I, I get that out of the way. But the sexual exceptionalism, something that occurred in prison that it's, I'm focused on because it, it came right to my mind. It was a person, um, he was um, a Muslim, right? And he, they put him in a cell with someone who is uh, transsexual or trans, whatever the thing is, right? Um, at that time, if you had a, um, how can I say this? If you had a penis, you're going to the male's prison at that time. You, they didn't separate you at that time. Right. And he had a sexual, um, encounter, put it that way with this person. Right. And the person took the evidence to the sergeant and say, blah, blah, blah. He did this and that to me because that, that particular person wanted to be the cell with somebody else. So anyway, the guy got locked up, right? And then all of the other Muslims found out, right? And they were going to, we're going to do the, he, he says, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, well, I didn't mean to do this. I'm sorry, right? And they wanted to do this and do this to him because he broke this rule. And I was in the minority of saying, well, other people break rules too. Why Why you want to enforce it so much on this person who actually apologized for what he did some people say what he did was wrong and some people say what he did was not wrong. But the point is, he apologized. For, but because sex involved, especially homosexual sex, if you want to consider the person a male. But anyway, they were really ready to, I said, all right, well, why don't this other guy, he did this, he did that. And they didn't even apologize. But this person, you're ready to just do all this stuff. To, but after a while, the consensus came, well, okay, we're, we're going to leave this guy alone. So that's my sexual exceptionalism story in prison. Now let's go outside of prison. Just recently um, in New York, had a situation where a guy, a guy, you know, he came out and he had a girlfriend. They were arguing, pushed on a train, on front of the train track, poop, cut the feet off. They have to amputate the feet. Another one in Brooklyn, um, the guy, he was, you know, trying to hit on these girls. They were teenage uh, uh, girls, they, but they were like twins, right? And so he wound up, she said no, and he couldn't, he didn't like the rejection. So he stabbed them both. Well, he stabbed the one girl who rejected him. Then the other one tried to intervene, so he stabbed her, right? And then I noticed how people talk about this differently. And when, I, when a sex crime happened, they're mad. 
But when a when a when somebody's penetrated with a penis, they're mad. When somebody penetrated with bullets or not, now they're sad. Oh, this is. I said, well, why you talk about this? They did the other the other way. I mean, the other day, uh, a sex crime happened. Then, um, you guys were really angry. Now, when this happened, you're sad. Why? So this is part of what I do. I try to get people to see this in a way that doesn't challenge them, where they can think about it, you know, on a person-to-person -person, um, level. So that's part of the work I definitely want to call it work. I don't really talk to the legislators uh, too much. I should do it more, but I, I don't talk to the legislators because I've been cursing too much. I need to stop, I need to stop that, right? So I'm going to offer uh, just some advice because um, – because this has been useful to me. If you think about the Black Panthers, right? Huey Newton, I remember it just stuck in my mind. He said, um, well, he came up with, the, with the, the term, or let's say the, the word pig to describe the police officer. Because they had this threatening, you know, they were like people like they were 10 feet tall. And many people see the pig as like a disgusting. And so they started calling the cops pigs, right? So... A lot of us see these um, officials, um, parole officers, probation officers, police, as if they're 10 feet tall. So I see a, about 150 participants on this webinar. I hope some of them will adopt this term that I came up with. I started calling these people the penis police. Now, if you do not have a, a penis, just use the, <laughs> the correct and corresponding uh, <laughs> P word that reflects your anatomy. But I don't want them to have, oh, well, you know, these people are 10 feet tall. Um, they're this and they're that. If they said the judge lived, I said, no, why are you calling yourself a sex offender? But the judge, what, not the judge, why are you calling yourself that? But, but who's the judge? Right? Every time you call yourself that, it does something to you. Every time you call yourself a self respecter, it does something for you. Self-talking, self-talk is very important. So I, you know, I have these conversations with, with people, you know, that's part of my work, just trying to change people's mind on a person to person level, you know? So did I over my five minutes? I'm going to pass it on before, I, before, they cut, before they cut my mic off. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Abazi. All right. And I'd like to move on to uh, Emily Harwitz, please. Thank you. Well, yeah, that's a tough act to follow. Um, not only the <laughs> previous speakers, but Abbasi, you always, um, you make me laugh. You speak about very painful and difficult experiences in a way that is is fun. And that's unusual, right? Because these are really heavy topics. Yep. <laughs> um, I want to thank um, Melinda for moderating, Amber and Jason for hosting. It's very cool that uh, Restorative Action Alliance was mentioned uh, today in the Connecticut Law Tribune, and they mentioned their testimony uh, to the Connecticut Housing Committee. That's really terrific. Um, anyway, so um, I will just talk a little bit about what um, we talked about before as, as the panel was being planned, um, which is, you know, where does sex exceptionalism, I love that term, Aya, and I should use it more, where does it come from? What are the origins of it? So I'm a sociologist and um, that's, this is the topic that I've dedicated my entire professional life to. And I've been trying to figure out where did where where do these attitudes come from? Um, like Aya, I also started out um, as a feminist. I also uh, came to this after observing the abuses in in feminist um, criminal legal initiatives, such as specialized domestic violence courts. Um, as she mentioned, if you spent time in a specialized domestic violence court, you saw mostly people of color, people who are unemployed, and you saw people getting the book thrown at them. Um, it didn't look very much like anything um, related to feminism. It was just about using the state to punish people. So I'm really glad you started with that. But um, I will kind of address this bigger issue. You know, why are people who are committed, who commit sexual offenses, um, 
treated as more dangerous and less worthy of redemption than anyone else. Um, in my recent book, my last chapter is called Worse Than Murder, because one of the things that I think probably most people on this call recognize is that if you're convicted of taking someone's life, you are treated better. You're treated better while you're incarcerated. You're treated better after you get out. You're treated better um, by society. You're viewed with less contempt. And it's always interesting when I teach my course um, and students will say, yeah, you know, it is, it is worse than murdering somebody. And I'll say, well, why is why is committing a sexual offense or harming someone sexually? Why do you, how can it possibly be worse than taking their life? And I think Aya mentioned this a bit, which is that um, they'll say, well, because their life is over. They can't have a life. After experiencing sexual harm, you can never live again. So they should be destroyed in, in, in the most vindictive way possible because you can never recover from, from that. And that um, is not something that um, is particularly about like agency or anything feminist about the idea that if you're sexually harmed, you can never overcome it. Um, but that's one of the justifications given by both feminists and leftists and those on the right uh, for why these laws are okay and why these um, having these feelings about people commit convicted of sex offenses, that what they do takes somebody's life away. That's it, it's even worse than taking somebody's um life away. Um, and, and, and their perceived dangerousness is formally represented in our society by both their public branding and this special web of rules that applies only to them, not just the registry, but everything. Um, and their status as irredeemable is very, is, is confirmed by their social exclusion. Um, and this observation is made over and over and over by those of us like, uh, as I also said, like the canary in the coal mine, we see this. It's not just the registry. Um, for my last book, I interviewed a bunch of people who are on private registries or people who had come off the registries and they still experienced um, the branding and the the contempt. Of course, it was like a little bit better than being on a public registry and they were subject to less restrictions and things like that, but they were still treated um, on a micro level by people in society as being unworthy of redemption um, as somebody who did something that was so disgusting they should be kept on the fringes um, forever. And that's not to say that all, I, I recognize that all those with uh, convictions and all those impacted by the criminal legal system face profound barriers to reentry. Re um, many face employment and housing discrimination and financial stress, um, and many also experience social exclusion due to just the stigma of having criminal legal history. Um, and those convicted of taking lives and other offenses that are classified as serious or violent are often also ineligible for certain policies and programs um, that are open to other with criminal histories. But I guess the main point that I wanna make is that um, when exceptions are made to these stringent measures, I think everyone here knows that those with sex offenses are almost always um, left out. Um, we know that when states allow the sealing or expungement of records after a certain period, they commonly exclude those having serious or violent felonies, but even misdemeanor sex offenses are the only misdemeanor category that is always excluded from expungement or sealing. Um, in addition, we know that after criminal legal sentences are completed, even supervision, no others with non-sexual offense histories um, experience the same hyper-stigmatization and harassment um, that's caused by registration, community no notification, and also the things that are not public, the pu punishing limitations of residency restrictions, travel, presence, proximity restrictions. And um, I think understanding why we're willing to forgive others who inflict grave and serious harm, including as Abbasi said, like uh, amputating someone's feet, if I understood the story correctly, um, but not those who commit crimes involving sex um, 
and I understand few will outrightly say that a sex offense is objectively worse than a murder, but some do, but our laws and our attitudes starkly reveal that we're far more forgiving of someone who has, has committed a murder. Um, and the registry itself indicates for all practical purposes that we're more comfortable in the presence of someone who has taken another person's life than we are with somebody who has a sexual offense um, in their past. I've talked about this frequently, but I run a program at the college where I teach for people who've been impacted by the criminal legal system and the community, and this is common across the country at many institutions that have such programs. Um, few of these programs um, exclude any offense besides sexual offenses. Um, outright. There's special federal laws regarding people with sexual offenses even coming on campuses. Um, but these programs all are, are very open about, you know, not asking about offenses uh, in criminal legal history and what the offenses are. And um, there's been a lot of movement. They used to exclude people with uh, quote unquote violent offenses, but they no longer do. But sexual offenses are something that is just always off the table. It's not even considered um, as, as something um, that will be considered by institutions. Um, and there's a lot of research on the historical and political origins, um, you know, the beliefs and emotions that have led to these laws and these attitudes. Um, but I, I'll just end by saying the upshot is, is that I think um, it's clear that it's it's because it's a, a bipartisan um, issue. We can all come together on, you know, uh, our mutual hatred and fear and disgust uh, towards anybody labeled um, somebody who's committed a sex offense. And in particular, um, the left and the right, Democrats and Republicans, Me Too, QAnon, all of these recent movements um, show that um, people who are convicted of sex offenses are in a uniquely marginalized position. And I think that um, it's really important uh, to recognize that if you don't defend people and what's happening to people who have been convicted of sex offenses, this can easily be extended to other groups. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I'd like to return now to um, our moderated questions, returning back to each of you with um, a question that I have from Restorative Action Alliance for uh, you. So this question is for Aya. Aya, you've made some linkages between carceral feminist influences on the law and the rise of mass incarceration. What do you think this has meant for efforts to end gender-based violence, particularly in marginalized communities? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, you know, for me, I, when I look at the history of feminist collaboration with criminal law and the penal state, it's so wasn't inevitable or even really that expected. Because if you go back to this really critical moment in the early 70s, right, when second wave feminists were kind of organizing and saying, hey, you know, we need to do something about gender based violence. We're really looking at people, um, you know, Abbasi had mentioned the pigs, like a lot of of the women who were part of this movement had taken part in the Vietnam protests, Vietnam War protests, and really did actually consider the police to be pigs and fascists and would call them that. And so in the very beginning of the women's movement, um, there was this idea that actually incarceration was the alternative, right? Now we say alternative to incarceration, like that was the weird alternative. So there were all kinds of ideas of, you know, sort of harm reduction programs, uh, restorative programs, economic programs, even housewife wages, like all kinds of different ideas of programs hanging around and how to reduce gender-based violence. But within about six or seven years, law enforcement became the centerpiece of anti-domestic violence activism. And I kind of tell the story of how that happened. But basically, 
what it had to do with was lawyers. Um, some extremely powerful lawyers sued for a right to arrest. And that just kind of took over that effort to get the police to arrest. Soon the police were on board and you have this, this model spring up. And so, you know, it, it, it's really unfortunate that several decades later, we come to a point where it's almost impossible to imagine tackling gender-based violence outside of the criminal legal system. And in fact, um, things like domestic violence and rape become the justifications for the criminal legal system at a point in time in which people were at the George Floyd protests and they're saying like, this is a racist system, this is a really violent system, but we can't get rid of it because what about rapists and abusers, right? And so it really, it's, it's very unfortunate, but, but feminists have also been on the forefront of saying things like, well, fine, you can dabble around with mediation, but not too much because we could never mediate a DV or a rape case because women are going to be second raped by that process. Um, you know, and this has been a, like a really familiar trope too. Even the little protections you have for criminal defendants, the idea is, well, you know, if criminal defendants have a right to cross-examine or a right to put on evidence, well, the trial becomes a, a second rape. So just like basically sit down and go to jail. So it, you know, it wasn't inevitable, but it's come to the point where the sort of left-right feminism meets sex exceptionalism idea of these worst of worst crimes are propping up a system in the face of a, of a very significant critique and attack in the last few years. And it's just really unfortunate the role that like a justice seeking movement like feminism has played and continues to play in it. And just one quick thing, the slew of laws that came in after Me Too is mind boggling. All kinds of internet sex offenses, getting rid of not just um, uh, statute of limitation in child sex cases, but also in adult sex cases, redefining intoxicated sex as incapacitated sex and affirmative consent. I mean, just and the and uh, new sex trafficking, new lewdness offensive. I could just rattle off. These are real carceral consequences of Me Too. And when you ask, like the feminist students in my classes, they're like, "Oh no, Me Too was just about empowerment and survivorship." And I'm like, "Yeah, but in in the shadow of all this empowering language, we had a massive wave of criminal laws." Thanks, Aya. So important to um, put some light on that shadow that um, most people or many people are not aware of. Thank you. The next question is for C. C, you have recently done some writing about your experiences trying to obtain safe and affordable housing while contending with special requirements reserved only for people required to register. What do you think is the most valuable thing for people to understand about this? That is a tough, but very good question. Thank you, Melinda. So yes, I think that, um, well, to put into context is this. So individuals in my situation often find themselves in a rock and a hard place, having to choose between, of course, the cost of living that we all have to bear, you know, rent, food, gas, et cetera. But there are additional components that individuals who are pushing for or in favor of the kind of tough on crime rhetoric or who, as Aya was just talking about, who don't recognize the kind of repercussions of movements, the kind of social and legislative and legal repercussions of movements like Me Too or um, kind of um, certain types of paradigms of thinking. Um, they don't understand as individuals in my situation. So there is a cost valuation associated with just being able to maintain your freedom. And then there are obviously other um, more physical obstacles and to be more specific. So an individual who's on the registry, who is on supervision, for example, might have to pay for a drug test. That drug test, depending on your state, can run between 35 and hundred dollars. Then that individual will have to pay their supervision fee, depending on your state and jurisdiction within that 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 uh that for that supervision that could be between thirty to another hundred dollars a month, 
then that person could be on ankle monitor or some other form of electronic communication on their cellular device that can run them another 100 to $250 a month. Then there is the polygraph test that they want you to take. They want you to take a polygraph test to determine that you're in compliance with the conditions of being a person who is on the registry. They want you to do a polygraph, something that no scientist respects. The legal system won't even utilize it. It's inadmissible, but they want to utilize it so they can continue to garner money because it is a money system. Um, that can cost you another two to three, two to three hundred dollars, depending on what system you're in. And on top of that, individuals who are on the registry often find themselves up against the very horrifying one thousand foot um, restriction. And in some jurisdictions, I understand it's two thousand feet. Such as Florida has um, individual municipalities are able to determine the footage, but um, I think that it's important for individuals to understand that when we talk about rehabilitation. And when we talk about, you know, do the crime, do the time, that type of rhetoric, even as harsh as that sounds, what's implied there is people are of the opinion that there was a breach to the social contract. And there is an implicit understanding that once an individual has returned from the cold, dead grasp of the system, that they will be able to restructure their life, rebuild it, have some semblance of autonomy, humanity, and the ability to hopefully sustain themselves. Um, although with the recession and the cost of groceries right now, I don't know so much about sustenance, <laughs> um, but the, the, the key here is that that implicity is, an, is a lie. It's a lie and it's a blatant deception. And when people use things like, oh, the system is failing or the system is broken, this type of phraseology is deceptive because what it does is it lets us think that, oh, something that was structured to work really well needs to be re-oiled or recalibrated or reformed. And that's not the case at all. The system is functioning exactly as it was designed. And individuals who had they a different set of legal circumstances, armed robbery, petty larceny, any other offense, they would have some opportunity to, to restore themselves and restore their lives. However, individuals who are operating under the onus of the sex offender registry will never have, they will never have that in the same way. They will never have it quite as meaningfully. And there are some individuals who have remarkable success stories and they have um, extraordinary comebacks and they are there, they are the odds and that is wonderful because we need the odds. But the reality is that there is a vast majority of people who that implicit promise is not being honored. We have to remember that we can't keep people locked in to their worst moments, the moments that they regret more than anybody else does for all of their humanity. You know, the, we all have had moments as human beings um, of greater or lesser valuation. You determine that valuation for yourself, that it wasn't our best moment as a human. Um, and I think that we just need to make sure that we are recognizing that the laws that we have in place, the systems that we have in place right now, we're not enabling a part of the population to actually have a chance to come back from what they've gone through. Because not only has there been some, in many of these cases, been some harm commissioned, but there has been trauma sustained too. For many people that have that have um, sex related harms, um, sex related based convictions, they themselves have sustained trauma from their, their own actions. And they live with a great abundance of guilt, of shame, of regret, of a desire to go back and change things, to make amends. And it's with such profundity that most people cannot honestly begin to even imagine it. And I, I speak to, and I have spoken to literally hundreds of people. Um, and I just, then there's also a slew of people that have stories much, and I don't like to make valuations to say, oh, one type of sexually based um, uh, um, harm or offense, I hate that word, but it's just the first thing that came to my mind, um, is greater or less than another. But there was a story I read recently of a woman from Texas. I've actually been trying to get in touch with her for an interview I want to do. But um, she was involved in sex work from a very young age. Her story has a lot of 
familiarity to my own and um, got charged with like human trafficking and all this stuff that was like really absurd, just an over prosecution and over hammer down. Um, and what I found incredible is that this, like the majority of the, the, the transactional stuff that she was charged with occurred when she was a minor. And then that got prompted me to start doing research into juveniles who have been charged with sex related, uh, sexually related harms. And then you find out how many children, real children are on the registry and you realize how many children are going to be deprived for 50, 60, 70 years of the same caliber of life that another person can have um, because of a discrepancy of ideology around uh, uh, that the legal system has around what it considers offenses. And for me, that's horrific. It's terrifying. It's it's unacceptable, it's insupportable. And I just want us to remember that we are depriving people of the potential that they have to be, to be human, to be able to come back from moments that are not their best moments as humans. So that's it. Thank you so much, C, for that very complete uh, answer that shed so much light on um, on this issue, and I'm just blown away by the fact that there are all of those um, uh, expenses expected um, of That's people. <laughs> I mean, it's unbelievable, especially if there is no stable housing. How do you um, how do you have any kind of employment that can take care of those expenses? It's just insane. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're uh, we're running out of time a little bit, so my next two um, speakers, um, please keep it a little bit um, brief. We have lots and lots of audience questions. I'm going to move now to um, Abasi. Your question: As an activist and person trying to support others in reentry. What barriers or discrimination have you seen that are a direct result of the stigma around people who are impacted by the registry? And please unmute yourself, Abazi. Thank you. Okay, good. I'll, I'll, I'll mention two groups. Ones. One, I'm gonna, you know, saying that they live, the person who has that within them. I tell people, I say, listen, if you have a victim, your victim or victims, depending on the situation, can you own that moment. You don't contradict them on what they're saying they went through during that time. If they say you were, uh, uh, I don't want to use that word, <laughs> you were the worst person on earth, accept that because they own that. However, once you make a decision to, let's just say, go in a different way, go onward, upward, and forward, you can't let that guilt and shame, you can't drag that with you. If you stepped in something outside, you got to get that off. You can't keep that on you and then drag it all through your new home that you're building for yourself. Let the victim own that moment. Like you say, a barrier that that prevents people from moving forward. That's one of the that's an internal barrier. They, they, some people, some people don't care. They go right to sleep. They, they go on a good. They do whatever they do. They go right to sleep and they don't even care what they did. But some people do carry that, and they carry that in a way that holds them back. Let the victim or victims own that moment. Whatever they say, how they how they feel and what you did to them, don't argue with them. Let them have it. Only time you can contradict every, anybody, whether it's the victim in a respectful way or, or, or a penis police officer impersonating a judge, and they tell you, you are this, you are, no, 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 no. I, this is who I am. You don't tell me who I am. Who the hell are you? Or these psychiatrists, are they going to help me with my, who the hell are you, Viagra? Oh, I don't need you to, to involve in my, I don't need nobody involved in my sex life unless they're participating. That's what I tell these people. All right, now move on to the second thing. One of the barriers, and I think when people are arguing this and they're saying punishment or cruel and unusual punishment, they should specifically single this out is the states where they put the employer's address on the registry too. Because that's a whole separate thing than putting your address. 
Because one of the tools you can have to obtain employment when you're dealing with a medium or small size business, you can meet the actual owner or decision maker. Now, so you can, you could be in a situation where you can talk to that person and do, develop a relationship with that person, but it's a very high barrier to overcome where they're going to allow you to work there and their address, some states, the actual name of the business that, 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 that is put on the website too. You know, so that's like intensely economically undermining you, you know, because one of the like a, a, a business like Amazon or Walmart, you know, they're big enough where they don't care. But a small business that that really affects them. Now, I'm going to wrap this up because I don't like talking about a problem without talking about some type of solution. If you're in contact with the person who owns a small business or maybe a medium sized business or the decision maker, you, can, you don't have to bring a registry of criminal record or anything like that, but you can offer, you can say, listen, you know, um, offer a 1099 uh, relationship with them, a contract relationship with them, you know, where, you know, you agree to do certain tasks and they pay you for the tasks or whatever. Then you could just get into that later. So I'm going to end with that because I don't like to put out a gloom and doom or a problem without offering some type of solution. First solution is let the victim own that moment. Once you make a decision, that's it. All right. Second, talk to the person, try to get a 1099 relationship with them. So you're technically not employed by them. Thank you very much. And I'm going to pass it on before I get my mic cut off. <laughs> Thanks, Abazi. Sounds like great advice. And um, last but not least, Emily. Sorry, let me uh, let me give you a question. Based on your research, what do you see as the key contributing cultural factors that have fueled the moral panic that created and expanded the registry registry regime? And just a reminder, we have a long list of attendee questions. Yeah, I think actually that was what I uh, addressed in my comments earlier. But I just wanted to. Uh, respond to something that C said, which is really interesting to me and very moving, which is that um, one of the issues that we don't often think about in, in places where advocates meet and activists meet and, you know, thinking about ways to organize and push back and raise awareness about this regime is the impact on individuals that, you um, live life with these convictions and the two things you said that really moved me were first of all like you know here's a group of people who you know the worst thing they ever did is publicized day in and day out and they're living with this tremendous regret about a mistake they made um and they themselves are traumatized and not just emotionally, psychologically, and everything else, just like anybody who goes to, um, who's impacted by the criminal legal system, but also financially traumatized. Um, and then that's the population that you need to mobilize and and get together and fight back about these laws. And of course, like the sociologists and lawyers and, and everybody else are really good, but you need the people that are living these lives. And these are people who are particularly, um, overwhelmed and can barely um, survive in some ways. So I was really glad that you pointed that out and um, kind of highlighted the um, bravery and gumption it takes for all these people, 140 people to come out and, and talk about this stuff. Many of the people that I've interviewed throughout the years working on this, I interview them and then they kind of disappear. They come to one event and they can't, it's too much. Or they'll say, like, I'm just trying to live my life when I go to these events or I go to meetings or I go to like um, groups where they're talking about how to advocate. They just it's depressing. It's overwhelming. They just want to forget about it. So I just wanted to say I'm really glad that you're here and that you brought that up. Um, thank you. Thanks, Emily. <clears throat> I'm going to go to the attendee questions now. So um, some of those questions are open for anyone to answer, some are directed. And let me begin with um, my first question, the first question for you, for the panel, from Roderick. To the panel, has anyone experienced that a level of education makes a difference in how 
people react to this, or I suppose to this issue? Okay. Um, I have a note here that says Restorative Action Alliance is going to answer this question live. All right, I'm not sure what that means, but um, I'll hold that question aside and then I, I guess they'll type the answer. Um, I'll put that question aside and move on. Jeannie asks, I would like to hear thoughts on the meteoric rise in popularity of the quote unquote sex trafficking bogeyman. Are there previous episodes in history that parallel how this idea has caught the American uh, in brackets suburban imagination or is there something different about this particular sex panic? Who would like to answer that question? Okay, see. This is a really good question. So it's actually really it's a good question. So a lot of the correlation between the way that America's policing apparatus has approached the sex trafficking boogeyman, as you called it, um, questioner, good questioner, is actually they use a lot of the same tactics they used for the war on drugs. Um, it's very similar tactics, actually. It starts primarily with propaganda. Um, so there is a rise. And if you live in some of the states like California, the Bay Area there, or you live in the Atlanta, Georgia area, or you live in New York, or you live in Miami, or you live in the Houston or Dallas area, you are probably keenly aware um, of this rise in discussion in media coverage and in increased legislation and policing, as well as police task force related to sex trafficking. Now, there is undoubtedly a sex trafficking issue in the world and in the States. Anybody that says there isn't, that would be a problem because we have plenty of women coming forward telling us their stories. There is that issue, but the issue in America with the current politic is not quite what it is on the global scale. What you have is you have a lot of individuals who are voluntarily involved in sex work, and that is not the same thing as being involuntarily sex trafficked. And that is where we have a very um, pernicious agenda being executed by um, a group of individuals in politics and in religion. Um, and what we need to be aware of is the reason why that rise is happening is it's the, the continuing criminalization and penalization of three things. One, autonomy, because governments hate autonomy. Two, the ability to Cooperate to make funds for yourself in a way that the government has not found a way to regulate and tax. Okay. And three, it's an ongoing war against individuals of poverty, against women, but very specifically against women, and against LGBT people as well. A lot of individuals of color, additionally. Um, so there is this rise going on in rhetoric and around criminalization and penalization, and it's an ongoing war of the body. And what we need to be aware of is the reason why it's happening is the three things that I just listed. It, they, they, it's intrinsically connected with that. But when it comes to low com income communities, when it comes to communities of color, when it comes to the LGBT community, and when it comes to and any individual, woman, male, any person that is choosing to use sex work um, out of their voluntary decision or out of desperation of circumstances, we need to understand why that's happening. I think that it's important for us to kind of consider some of the associations around power. And I would really love to have um, Aya chime in maybe on the back end of this because a lot of the associations for power of this are directly, they're anti-feminist. When it comes to a lot of the policing around the body, it's always been deeply rooted in controlling women's bodies. All of the current stuff that is geared against LGBT is kind of an extension of that because that same kind of um, misogyny and kind of a uh, hatred of otherness is a corruption or a mutation of that misogyny and hatred towards women. So 
a lot of these issues are stemmed in the patriarchy. It's stemmed in a desire to maintain control. It's stemmed in a desire to regulate the body. It's, of course, a money and economic issue. And it's a continuing class war against those who are utilizing one of the only, what they perceive as one of the only resources available for them to maintain and to sustain. Can I jump in just with a quick story? Please. Please do, yes. In 1875, um, the United States was beginning its first panic over, quote unquote, white slavery. And what white slavery basically was, was a way that society could coalesce at that time all of its sensibilities against, quote unquote, prostitution sex work. The prostitute had for a long time represented everything that was scary to organized society, organized patriarchal society where sex was within marriage, women only had children within marriage. So uh, amongst this panic on the West Coast in San Francisco, there was an associated yellow slavery panic that where at once there was a fear of too many Chinese immigrants coming and poisoning the blood of Americans with their exotic diseases um, their opium dens, and they were going to get white girls. And at the same time, they were bringing their prostitutes who were, because they were Asian, inculcated to sexual slavery. This panic, which brought together the left, which were white middle class feminists at the time who were turning their attention from slavery abolition to this white slavery abolition, and the most xenophobic right-wing male government, they got together and they passed the 1875 Page Act. And that was the very first anti-immigration act in US history. And it um, eliminated from entry into the United States, quote unquote, deboshed women. It created the immigration surveillance apparatus and immigration checkpoints, and it resulted in the virtual exclusion of Chinese women from California and paved the way for the Alien Exclusion Act. Later, the white slavery, which culminated in the Mann Act, which was bringing women across state lines for the purpose of prostitution, was the act that created the FBI. So to say that there have been trafficking panics in the past that were deeply racist, deeply sexist, and deeply carceral is an understatement. This has been a theme, and you know you can see with QAnon the type of um, you know sort of outlandish, anti-humanistic, extremely repressive ideologies that this sort of war on commercial sex springs. Thank you both so much for that, that history as well. All right, well, I have another question. We are actually going to go to, we were planning to end at 8.45. We will go to 8.55 because of the number of questions we have. So um, let's move on. From Esther, what advice would you have for a quote unquote sex offender therapist? or any social worker working on the individual level? Who would like to take that question? Um, Emily, might you take that question? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, um, I think if you are able to pick your therapist, you might, want to pick somebody who is um, aware of the harms of um, the registry. And I know there are some good therapists. I went to an ATSA conference, but I'm sure you know many people have really negative experiences with therapists, especially when it's state mandated. Um, so I don't, I, I feel like I'm probably not the best person to answer because I've, I've been very troubled by much of um, much that I've learned about people who offer um, treatment to people on the registry. Um, 
especially but but there are some good providers and there's people like Jill Levinson in Florida who uh, make efforts to um, challenge the registry and the restrictions and talk about how it's not helpful for treatment. But um, I'm prob I'm I'm somebody who's pretty um, cynical about about most treatment providers. Thanks, Emily. And yet, unfortunately, it's mandated often. Right. And so what does a person do? Um, yeah. I'm thinking um, in the best case scenario, they might be able to shop around, but that's not always the case. All right. Um, Abaza, you have your mic open. Did you want to answer that question also? About the therapist? No, yeah. I yeah. guess I just closed it because I, I don't want I don't want. Oh, <laughs> OK. All right, next question. Um, this is from Joanne. Aya, your intro hits here in Washington State. Carlos Rodriguez and Tim Ballard ran entrapment stings on adult dating sites. No children involved. Charges are a violent sex offense. No other offense is charged as violent unless there is a victim. Based on entrapment conversation led by aggressive detectives result in class A felonies, lifetime registry, lifetime community custody. The hate and fear mongering used to stoke these unfair and over the top sentencing and laws must be talked about and advocated. Good job panel. Um, any, any thoughts on that Aya? And I think just a little bit, this goes back to what, what C is is talking about too, you know, none of this denies that there's real harm that comes from trafficking, from compelled sex. There are like myriads of ways in which sex, you know, can harm people and myriads of ways in which non-sexual activities and arrangements can harm people. Um, but when it when it comes to sex, it's it's just this bizarre thing you know it kind of reminds me that that sting reminds me of a case I had when I was a public defender but it also reminds me of this operation underground railroad I don't know if if any of you have heard of this but this is like the perfect marriage of like sort of a more left-wing humanitarian anti-trafficking sensibilities that like a lot of at least self-proclaimed feminists have been like, oh yeah, we love this you know rescue industry and this really right-wing sort of pro QAnon, steal the border things. And what they do is they go do these televised rescue raids in foreign countries where basically what they're doing is sending a team down that is creating the demand for, you know, child sex trafficking to, to really poor people and then filming it for a spectacle. And that reminds me of some of these things. I remember in 2002, I mean, pretty soon after 9-11, I was a, a federal public defender and I had a case in which, um, you know, an agent was was you know on the line in a, in a Miami chat room, uh, pretending to be a fourteen year old, and this was kind of the, the 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 age where they always pretended to be precocious fourteen year olds, and they would go you know after twenty year old men, and then you know they would they would get them for solicitation. Incidentally, under the Mann Act, that's the federal act they use, that White Slavery Act. Um, but, you know, what I found out about this particular agent, his name was Tim, was that he was a Secret Service agent, you know, right after 9-11. And this is what they were doing. Now, that's not to say there isn't harm in trafficking, but this whole model of the sting, right, is sort of halfway between a, you know, QAnon slash male law enforcement fever dream and you know the carceral state and does it really interrupt the cycles of vulnerability no um you know and, and some of them are just like straight out and out racist like um you know the 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 anti-trafficking operation that robert Kraft was was caught up in um you know it was called like something like operation gilded cage and they went on like rubmaps.com they they've called you know massage parlors standard Asian model of trafficking. I mean, it, it, and so you look at this whole, you know, trafficking sting world and saying like, 
who's kind of like the deviant being 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 caught up in all of this production of of crime. Thank you, Aya. All right, our last question is from Zachary. As a co-founder, uh, Zachary Tackett, as a co-founder of the Autism Innocence Project, I've observed a recurring pattern when engaging with legislators and public officials. It's striking how many of them appear genuinely surprised when confronted with the reality of the disproportionate involvement of individuals with autism, intellectual disabilities, or other developmental disabilities in cases categorized as sex crimes. This issue is something we deal with regularly, as evidenced by the daily influx of inquiries from concerned families reaching out to our organization. Would anyone be able to comment on this? Emily, you're shaking your head. Yes, so please I go can ahead. comment. Actually, um, that's a really good point, Zachary. And recently, um, there is, I'm just looking for the name, there is a group of prosecutors um, in Washington, um, and they are starting a project because um, some of them, a group of them reached out to me like a few weeks ago and they said just what you said like we're learning that there's a disproportionate number of people with um developmental disabilities on the registry and um can you tell us about that so i had a meeting with them and i know they um are interested in uh learning more and doing something and it does appear that just like with juveniles or other special groups it is a group that um does evoke you know special interests somewhat maybe because so many people are impacted by developmental disabilities and there's been a lot of awareness but anyway um and it's something that um i've done a little work on but um it does seem like there is a movement within um prosecutorial organizations i i'll i'm gonna tell you the group in a minute um and i'll put it in the chat to address this. Thanks, Emily. Uh, let's see if we have another question ready to go. We are about almost at the end of our time. Um, Veronica, um, I'm just going to, Amber's sending me a note. Okay, she says, we still have over 40 questions. We can share the list with the panelists after the webinar. Um, if they're able to give us their thoughts, we can post them, which I think is a great idea. Um, we're about at the end of our time. So um, rather than uh, sending you another question, I'm just going to send you my heartfelt thanks for all of you being here um, and for all of our attendees, thank you so very much. We're grateful to each and every one of you. Um, thanks for taking your time. Um, I'd let if you'd like to learn more about the topic, we invite you to visit restore, restorativeactionalliance.org to sign up for updates, find action alerts, make a donation, or explore volunteer opportunities. To hear from people and families impacted by the criminal legal system, listen to RAA Restorative Action Alliance's podcast, Amplified Voices at AmplifiedVoices.show, or on all major podcasting apps. You can also follow Restorative Action Alliance on X, formerly Twitter. Together we can end cycles of sexual harm and state violence in pursuit of a world where all people have the opportunity to heal and thrive. Thank you all so very much. Have a beautiful evening.